Tashi Dilek, welcome to Tibet TV. When China completely annexed Tibet in 1959, Tibetans led by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama sought refuge in India. Indian government and her people rendered their full support when Tibetans were undergoing unimaginable turmoil. In the last 62 years, the Tibetan refugees not only found a second home in India, but also received love, respect and friendship from its people. Today, there are over 14 Tibet support groups in India advocating for the cause of Tibet, particularly creating awareness and garnering support from the common Indians. In today's episode of Tibet TV's program on Tibet support groups, we have Professor Anand Gumaji, who is the co-founding member of Indo-Tibet Friendship Society, one of the Tibet support groups in India. He has been one of the staunch supporters of Tibetan cause in modern memory. Welcome to Tibet TV, sir. It is an honor to have you with us today, sir. Sir, I would like to ask you about the Indo-Tibet Friendship Society because uh, many of our viewers may not know what is Indo-Tibet Friendship Society. So, sir, can you tell us about its genesis and your association with it, sir? It is a very important question. India-Tibet Friendship Society was originated in the initiative of Indian national leaders like Jay Prakash Narayan, Achari Kripalani, and Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia in 1960s, when His Holiness the Dalai Lama was forced to come into exile with thousands of freedom-loving Tibetans as a risk reaction to the Chinese occupation of Lhasa in 1959. There was a conference organized in Kolkata, Afro-Asian conference in solidarity with Tibet. And after that, a body came into existence, which was the mother organization of India-Tibet Friendship Society. It has been functioning since 1960s as a platform of unity between Tibetan and Indian people, and as a forum to create support and understanding about the Tibetan cause among the people of India. I became associated with it in 1990s when there was a very important national conference of Tibetan and Indian intellectuals and opinion makers at New Delhi in 1993. This was a time when Chinese Premier Laping La came to India and there was brutal repression of Tibetan protesters by the police of India. It was objected by the Supreme Court and it was criticized by friends of Tibet all over the country. When we all got together, we thought that we must structure our association better. And then the gathering selected me as the Secretary of India Tibet Friendship Society with Professor Parimal Kumar Das as the President and Lama Chosral Zotpa as the Secretary. Soon we created a student wing, which was called Students for Free Tibet, a women platform called All India Women Association for Free Tibet. And since 1994, we have been functioning. Today, there are 110 district units in 12 major states of India. We are also partner with Himalayan Committee for Action in Tibet called HIMCAT, which has branches all over Himalayan provinces of the country. Today, we are also working under the coordination of Core Group for Tibetan Cause, which is a body created by 
Tibetans in exile to create better coordination among friends of Tibet in India. So that's how we function. Nationally, we work with our committee and within the country, we also work in coordination with other friendly groups for the common cause of Tibet and Tibetan identity through core committee for the Tibetan cause being organized by India Tibet Coordination Office of Tibetan administration in exile. Sir, as you have said, uh, when we look back, there were many towering Indian leaders like Jay Prakash Narayan who played key role in introducing Tibet and its geopolitical importance to India. How relevant do you think is their position in current geopolitical scenario and also how important it is that the Indian government and its people to understand this, sir? I think there were three major points presented by stalwarts like Jayaprakash Narayan before the people of India. First of all, they wanted India to be openly and absolutely supporting the cause of Tibet as articulated and defined by the Tibetans in exile led by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So that was the first purpose, to support the Dalai Lama and the Tibetans in exile in their efforts to protect their identity and regain their autonomy and sovereignty. Second point was to bring people of India and Tibet together through discussions, seminars, literature generation, campaigns, and all other democratic ways. And third was to make India go for a total Himalayan policy so that we understand the strategic needs of the Himalayan borders as well as the significance of Tibet for security of India. Today, in last 60 years, these three points have become more valid. We do need to understand and appreciate and support the cause of Tibet as articulated by the Dalai Lama. We also must have more and more information and understanding about the Tibetan situation among the people of Tibet and India and there is need for a comprehensive Himalayan policy. We should look at the strategic, economic, political and cultural needs of the total of Himalayan region, including Himalayan provinces of India and the neighboring countries like Tibet, Bhutan, Nepal, Mongolia and all others. So there is more relevance than ever before of our founding goals and we must pursue it as diligently as possible. Sir, uh, since you are an ardent uh, follower of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, I'm sure you are aware of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama's fourth commitment, that is revival of ancient Indian wisdom. So, sir, how do you see this message of His Holiness when he says Indians are our gurus and Tibetans are their chelas? Well, uh, it is a very well-respected declaration of the Dalai Lama that he has got five goals, five purposes in his life. As a Tibetan, he needs to work for the Tibetan identity. As a Buddhist monk, he has to spread the message of Buddha and live a, an ideal life as a monk. And as a human being, he has to promote understanding and compassion and friendship through the path created by Buddha for whole humanity. But as someone who is a child of Indian teachings, he is a Buddhist and Buddha was from India, so he also thinks that his life must be dedicated to the purpose of spreading respect and understanding of Indian wisdom. Now, this 
goal of His Holiness the Dalai Lama makes him our new guru because 200 years of foreign rule have created a big gap between our history and us. Our understanding about Indian identity, culture, civilization, spirituality is damaged by the foreign rule and westernization of our history and our education system. So the contribution of the Dalai Lama is so valuable because he is a living example of the Nalanda school of wisdom, Mahayana tradition rooted in the teachings of the Buddha and the traditional partnership of people of Tibet and India through the Buddhist discourse of life and knowledge. So we are very thankful to the Dalai Lama and all the Rinpoches who are making us aware of our ancient identity, its value, and its relevance. So as I said, we are very pleased that His Holiness the Dalai Lama believes that India is Guru and Tibet is Chela, but in reality today, he is our new Guru who understands India much better than many of the Indian masters and scholars. So he is our Guru, he is our teacher, he is our most respected guide and mentor in so many ways. Uh, sir, uh, I would like to ask you about a very popular notion in India, and that is uh, Tibet's freedom being India's security. So, sir, how do you validate uh, this notion? This is a very relevant understanding because before Tibet was occupied by China, the whole Himalayan frontier from Ladakh to Arunachal had Tibet as the neighboring country buffer state. And because of the nature of Tibetan people and their government at Lhasa, it was all an open frontier with people coming and going freely, the traders, the pilgrimage, the tourists, and many others. There was no presence of military from either side. There were very few check posts, and there was no system of controlled militarized border patrolling. But since 1959, the whole scenario has changed. India has become very insecure. Chinese forces became aggressive in 1962. And since 1962, that whole area of nearly 4,000 long kilometers is very militarized, very underdeveloped, very stressful and very problematic for the whole development of India because there is a new cost of security and defense which was just not there. Suppose Tibet was not occupied and suppose that there was no military of China on Indian borders from Ladakh to Arunachal, we would have saved a lot of money and invested that money in health, education, employment, agriculture, business, and transport. But no, Chinese are occupying Tibet and therefore they are occupying Himalayan border zone. So freedom of Tibet is security of China. A China, um, freedom of Tibet is security of India. And China is playing with our security by occupying Tibet. If Chinese military is withdrawn from Tibet, we will have whole Himalaya as zone of peace and prosperity. Uh, sir, uh, you have uh, just pointed out that uh, His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama's contribution is immense. So, sir, I would like to ask you a question on this note. Starting from erstwhile MP Shanda Kumarji, uh, many Indian leaders and people believe that India's highest civilian award, Bharat Ratna, must be conferred on His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. So, sir, uh, do you see that happening anytime soon, sir? See, this is a theme of honoring those who are jewels of Indian people, jewel for India, and not necessarily born in India. 
we have conferred this honor to khan abdul ghaffar khan who was forced to leave india after partition and was formally not an indian after 1947 we presented this honor to dr nelson mandela who was born a south african and was connected with india only ideologically because he followed the path of non violence truth and reconciliation as developed by mahatma gandhi dalai lama is not only living in india since 1959 which is nearly 60 years out of his long life of 85 years he is also presenting india indian teaching in every sermon every teaching every discourse every interview he is also one of the best examples of indian wisdom indian civilizational values which were developed and maintained in tibet so in the eyes of the people of india he's already jewel of india he's already a bharat ratna now it will be in the fitness of things that the government of india formally decorates the dalai lama with this honor it will be not really honoring dalai lama as much as honoring us because dalai lama is one of the best representatives of indian civilization indian value system as defined by the buddha so he will be honoring us by accepting our request to accept bharat ratna and i totally support this uh, sir uh, when you look at uh, today's uh, political situation um what are the priorities of indo-tibet friendship society sir there is a new situation in india today because of the chinese military movements in ladakh area there was already serious threat to our security when they claimed certain parts of bhutan a little while ago indian army has a treaty of joint defense with bhutan and indian army had to move in dokla area to maintain integrity and security of bhutan today we are in threat from the chinese movement several of our soldiers have been killed they also claim arunachal to be part of china and they object to the movements of indian president prime minister of india or our guest the dalai lama into arunachal area they don't allow citizens of india living in arunachal to visit china with indian passport so today india needs to be awakened alerted because unfortunately in last 20 years with the new economic policy chinese have occupied indian market indian students have been going to china for their various educational programs indian businessmen have invested in china and they are making benefit out of chinese economy and of course china is continuing to encircle india by establishing forces naval forces by borrowing islands from indonesia very close to nicobar andaman islands they have occupied land in pakistan occupied kashmir and have militarized the india nepal border area by bringing train from china to nepal they are not friendly nation they are very aggressive but we have been believing that china has changed it is no more an authoritarian country and we had forgotten about the tragedy of tibet uyghur people and southern mongolia people so today india tibet friendship society must 
get more active to give the facts before the people of India who have been eluded, who have been under wrong impression that China has changed, so they will be doing things more friendly way, not only with Indians, but also Tibetans. And we must not talk about Tibet. No, we have to change this understanding. So today, there are three challenges before the people working for India Tibet Friendship Society. Number one, to present the facts of Chinese aggression in Tibet and in India. Number two, to educate people about the tragedy being suffered by all neighboring areas of mainland China, including Tibet and eastern Turkestan and southern Mongolia. And three, to give strength to the Tibetans who are trying to fight for their identity, their culture, and their country. Sir, one last question. Uh, you have been a strong supporter of Tibetan cause for a very long time, sir. So why are you optimistic about uh, Tibet's freedom? I think that there are three reasons to be more optimistic about success of the Tibetan campaign today than before. As I told you that in last 25 years, particularly after 1990s, there was a new propaganda in India and the world about China changing, China getting better, China becoming friendly with the world. But in last few months, the world has been given very rude shocks and South Asia, particularly India, has been victim of Chinese aggressiveness. The Indian diplomacy with China today stands failed and exposed, vulnerable. So that makes me optimistic that when we tell about the truth of Tibet, people will believe because now India is also a victim of Chinese aggressiveness, unreasonable military power of China is the supreme factor in all the initiatives of the Chinese, including with India. One reason. Second reason, I am so positive because the new generation of Tibetans, not only outside Tibet, but within Tibet, is much more committed to protect their identity and culture. After nearly 60 years of Chinese occupation, Chinese have failed to win the hearts and minds of the Tibetan people. There is tremendous resistance to Sinization process in, China, in Tibetan schools, in Tibetan families, in Tibetan intelligentsia. And this has been reflected by a wave of protest activities, including large number of self-immolations by Tibetan monks and nuns who have not seen the Dalai Lama who have no idea about what happened with Tibet in 1959-60, and still they are fighters for freedom. And outside Tibet, the Tibetan community is becoming more and more visible all over the world. When we started working for the Tibetan cause in 1990s, there was the first effort to organize all world forum of parliamentarians for Tibetan cause. The first conference was initiated and planned by a great Indian leader, George Fernandez. But you will be surprised to know that Indian government at that time did not give visa to most of the people who wanted to come. And there were not many people coming in any case. A few countries were prepared to send their delegation. Today, the World Forum of Parliamentarians for Tibetan Cause is a very vibrant platform of people believing in democracy and justice from more than several dozen countries. Similarly, when we were working, the international solidarity for Tibet was a very weak story. Only a few countries were prepared to accept the Dalai Lama and invite the Tibetans for consultation. Today, the international platform of Tibetan supporters 
has more than 100 countries rallying together. Recently, there was a big conference, Tibet 550 at Dharamsala. And it was such an impressive gathering where there were former foreign ministers, several parliamentarians, many diplomats, many statesmen, many media people, many university people from all the five continents of the world. North America, South America, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, Asia, Africa. So this is a very big basis for my optimism. And finally, the people of India are more educated, more sensitized, more informed, not only because of people like us, but because of your efforts. The Tibetan community's information system, their methods of keeping Indian people updated about situation in Tibet is much more impressive, very effective. Their use of television, their use of print media, their use of websites is making our job easier. So that all together makes me very optimistic that truth is spreading and truth shall prevail. Thank you so much, sir. With this, we're going to end uh, today's uh, program. Thank you so much for joining us today, sir. Thank you. I wish you good luck. And I hope that your initiative will be successful. Thank you very much.